Thanks, David, for a um, great, great presentation. I learned a lot from uh, his presentation. So I have different approaches for income inequality in the United States. I'm a um, competitive political scientist who are studying the impact of globalization and inequality. So today I'm going to speak about the globalization and inequality in the United, United States and the U.S. government's dilemma. So summary of our argument uh, today is our following. So inequality in the United States has increased over time with the increased share, uh, income share of the rich and re uh, decreased income share of the poor. And the increase in income, uh, inequality, uh, income inequality is mainly caused by enlarged globalization and deindustrialization in the United States. I'll explain about the globalization and deindustrialization later. And U.S. governments under this uh, increased inequality with globalization and deindustrialization confront a significant uh, dilemma. So globalization and deindustrialization increase the demand for social protection. However, globalization also limits the U.S. government's ability to increase tax revenues for redistribution. So I'm going to start with the trend of inequality in the United States. So this graph shows the Gini coefficients uh, in the United States. Gini coefficient shows the inequality in the overall society. It ranges from zero to one. So zero means totally equal society, and one means a totally unequal society. So as you can see, inequality, uh, Gini coefficient in the United States back in 1967 was about 40%, 0.4. But it has increased incrementally over time. And uh, in 2009, it's about uh, 0.46. So it has increased almost uh, 10% of Gini coefficient. So this another uh, graph also shows the pattern of uh, uh, income growth in the United States. So it shows the share of before tax income growth in the United States. So as you can see back in 1923, there was huge income gaps. And the top 1% got like almost 70% um, of income growth, while the bottom 90% got only 15%. Uh, but uh, 1960s, this um, inequality has you know, rapidly decreased. And there was um, the top 1% only got like 10% of uh, income growth, while the bottom 90% got almost 60, 65% of income growth, people tax income growth. However, this uh, trend, again, has changed over time. And if you see the last bar graph, you know, uh, in 2000, you know, the top 1%, again, is getting almost 65% of before tax income growth, while the bottom 90% uh, are getting only 15% of income growth. And this trend is also similar even after tax. And this graph shows the percent change in after tax income in the United States from 1979. So uh, as you can see, the red line shows the top 1% uh, after tax income. And from 19, uh, 1979, the top 1% uh, after income tax, after tax income has almost a 277% increase while the increase for the bottom 20% and middle, middle 60% are still modest, like 18% and 30, 38% and 65%. So why do we care about inequality? Why does the inequality matter? Because people care about inequality. So inequality matters because people evaluate their economic well-being relative to others, not just in absolute terms. Just because I bought a, a, a handphone today, I wouldn't be that happy if my friend got iPhone, brand new iPhone <laughs> yesterday. And we actually evaluate our well-being, material well-being relative to others, not just in absolute terms. So public actually cares about inequality. And inequality is also a significant barrier to economic growth. So increasing income gaps between the rich and the poor produce social tension, conflict, instability, all of which can hinder economic growth. So we observe this uh, social conflict 
you know, back in 19, uh, 2011. Uh, so occup uh, Occupy Wall Street movement is one of them, right? So they, they, they argue that they are 99% uh, and they were against the uh, you know, top 1%, right? And uh, another problem is economic inequality can lead to political uh, inequality. So surging, surging top incomes gives, uh, gives the top, owner, uh, top owners more ability to influence political process like uh, think tanks and lobbying and, and campaign funds. So how, why, 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 did it, uh, why has income inequality in the United States have increased? While there are various reasons, you know, most economists agree that the deindustrialization, you know, significantly contributed to the increase in income inequality. So what is deindustrialization? If I simply put it, uh, it is the transformation of the industry economy, uh, the manufacturing economy to, uh, service, uh, to the service economy. So deindustrialization has increased in the United States not just, in, not just in the United States, but also in other advanced countries. So, for example, manufacturing industries have declined over time, and also, um, uh, on the other hand, uh, high-tech and service industries have been rising. So this graph shows the decline of manufacturing industry relative to other industries in the United States, and it shows the output of each industry as a percent of GDP. So if you see uh, the blue, uh, blue dots at the top, this shows a to total manufacturing output as a share of GDP. As you can cle clearly see, it, actually the total manufacturing output as a share of GDP has rapidly declined over time. However, there are two red lines, the red dots and red lines. The red dots shows the finance, insurance, and real estate, and lentil and leasing. And the, uh, the red lines, which is increasing, Slowly is professional and business services. And another graph also shows uh, output of high tech manufacturing industries for industrialized countries. So at the top, there's a, a black lines, which is the United States, which, which actually shows that output of high tech manufacturing industries have increased over time in the United States. And the, it, it, uh, the other developed countries like uh, European Union. Uh, have, uh, have, have the similar trends. And output of commercial knowledge intensive services as a share of GDP has also increased over time. So United States has you know, almost 20% of GDP for the you know, output of commercial knowledge intensive services. So how did this, uh, this deindustrialization affect the income growth? So share of manufacturing in total, uh, this graph shows the uh, share of manufacturing in total employment. So as you can see, most industrialized countries has, uh, have uh, similar trends. So United States is here um, is the blue, uh, blue line in the middle, but most of the, country, mo most of the advanced countries have declining share of manufacturing sectors in total employment. And this graph shows the sector composition of U.S. employment. So as you can see, service sectors employment, the employment in service sectors has inclined, uh, increased over time, while the uh, agriculture, uh, employment in the agriculture sector has declined. And uh, the employment in industrial, uh, industrial sector has increased, uh, increased over time, but it, it started to decline from 1960. So how is it related to the income? So the effect of deindustrialization is related to jobs and wages for skilled workers. And, and there are more jobs and wages for skilled workers. As you can uh, imagine, you know, by and large, the high-tech uh, high -tech industries and service industries are mostly, you know, um, uh, mostly uh, inter in, in, <laughs> increase the jobs and wages for skilled workers. And the manufacturing industries are um, hiring uh, unskilled workers. So as the manufacturing sectors are declining, the jobs and wages for unskilled workers are going down. 
So uh, this graph shows the occupation distribution, uh, distribution in percent uh, in U.S. civilian employment. As you can see, the, you know, the blue line shows the high-skilled employment, which is professional and te uh, technical jobs and managers, and which is increasing dramatically over time, while you know, the low-skilled low jobs uh, are declining. So how is the globalization uh, related to this inequality? Uh, not only the industrialization, but also globalization in the United States has rapidly increased in recent decades. So globalization, by definition, is the in uh, increased integration, integration of uh, trade and capital and economy in the world. And you know, trade flows in the United States have increased, and capital flows and foreign direct investments have increased. So this graph shows U.S. imports and exports and trade balance in goods as a share of GDP. So as you can see, the, uh, both imports and exports in the United States have increased over time dramatically. And this uh, graph shows U.S. Ca uh, capital flows. So as you can see, there's more uh, inflows and outflows of capitals in the United States uh, in recent decades. And this, this graph shows uh, for a U.S. foreign direct uh, investment outflow. And uh, so as you can see, U.S. multinational corporations are investing into outside of the United States much more uh, in recent decades, uh, except nine, uh, 2005 when there was an economic uh, crisis. So, as you, uh, so globalization matters because globalization has precipitated the distribution and impact of deindustrialization in the United States. So, for example, United States mainly imports manufacturing goods produced by unskilled workers. So, simply food, we are importing more from China, more shoes and the textiles, you know, uh, from China. And the United States export uh, high-tech products and service goods uh, produced by skilled workers. So we are exporting more computers and iPods to China. So uh, this uh, table actually shows the manufacturing trade balance as a share of GDP. So at the bottom, there's the United States. So uh, manufacturing trade balance as a share of, GDP, uh, share of GDP in the United States are mainly negative and it has, it has increased over time. It just shows that U.S. Imports more, uh, imports more manufacturing goods than exports uh, export them. And the United States, U.S. multinational corporations create more jobs outside of the United States. And this, uh, this graph shows the jobs created by United, U.S. multinational corporations. As you can see, there are, you know, over time, there are more, uh, more jobs created by U.S. multinational corporations abroad compared to the jobs at home. And uh, interestingly, they, they have really be, uh, mirror image. So as there are more jobs created outside, you know, there are less jobs created at home by more, uh, U.S. multinational corporations. So U.S. government's dilemma. So what is U.S. government's dilemma? Globalization and deindustrialization, and uh, their result on income inequality, increased income inequality, increased the demand for social protection. So this table shows a level of support for compensatory programs in the United States. So um, first column shows, you know, how, uh, how you know, the uh, the survey, uh, U.S. Uh, respondents in the survey respond to the ex uh, support the expanding trade-related unemployment benefits. So as you can see, almost 60% of respondents in the survey strongly or somewhat favor expanding trade-related unemployment benefits. And second column shows you know, uh, shows this, uh, you know, the respondents' support for subsidies to companies facing import competition. So as you can see, again, almost 60% of respondents favor, somewhat strongly or somewhat favor, those subsidies. 
And third and fourth column shows the, you know, how much uh, respondents uh, support the special job training programs and tax in incentives for companies to relocate. And as you can see, almost 90% of respondents support these special job training programs and tax incentives for companies to re relocate. And this is also related to you know, respondents' concept about trade. So as you can see, those who think <coughs> trade has made things worse tend to support more for uh, expanded unemployment benefits, while those who think that trade has made things better, less supportive unemployment benefits program. So, so certainly, those who oppose trade tend to support the unemployment, unemployment benefits more. However, United States in general has lower, uh, lower level of social protection than the other advanced countries. Unemployment benefits in the United States, uh, United States are lower than others, and the trade adjustment uh, assistance program in the U.S. is still minimal. So this graph shows unemployment uh, insurance as a share of former net income in 2000, uh, 2010, and uh, these countries are OECD countries. So United States has lower uh, level of unemployment uh, insurance compared to Japan or Italy and Spain and others. And this table shows the spending on active labor market adjustment programs. And the first, uh, first column shows uh, the spending as a share of GDP, and second one shows the ratio of active labor market adjustment uh, spending as a share of GDP to the unemployment rate. And third column shows uh, the spending as a share of total spending on labor market programs. So as you can see, United States <coughs> has the lowest uh, spending uh, uh, in all of the categories. And uh, it has a lower uh, uh, active uh, uh, spending on active labor market adjustment programs as a share of GDP compared to other countries like Canada, France, Germany, Japan, and United Kingdom. So there's a, there are demands for social protection, but it is still low in the United States. So what should government do? U.S. government may, may or may not want to increase the social protection. However, globalization limits the U.S. government's ability to increase tax re uh, revenues for redistribution. Uh, U.S. tax revenues are mostly dependent on uh, capital taxes than labor taxes. And globalization limits U.S. Uh, US government's ability to increase uh, capital taxes. So this, graph, uh, this table shows the average effective labor to capital tax rates differentials, uh, differentials in uh, industrialized countries. So negative number means uh, the country is more dependent on capital. Positive, means, uh, positive numbers means you know, the country is more uh, dependent on labor tax. So as you can see, the U.S. has uh, minus 17, which means the United States tend to you know, uh, depend more on capital tax rates than labor tax. However, globalization... Uh, Puts, uh, pressures the most uh, pressures the governments to reduce welfare spending. Why? Because as globalization increases, if the government increases welfare spending, that means governments have to put more taxes. To spend more, you need more taxes. Otherwise, you're going to have high budget deficits. So how can how can government uh, if government put more uh, taxes? That is considered as cost for um, U.S. companies. Then, you know, under the international market competition, U.S. companies will be less competitive, right? So, uh, so simply put, if if they have to pay more taxes, that means they 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 have higher cost for production. So they'll be less competitive in the international market. Or, you know, as capital became more uh, mobile. 
because of globalization, if United, uh, United States uh, put more uh, taxes for capita, for example, they can just simply move their money to other countries. So U.S. corporate federal income tax collection as a share of GDP over time has declined uh, over time. And this graph shows the percentage of income uh, from capital gains and dividends. As you can see, those capital gains, which are not related to the labor, are actually related to the income groups. So top 0.1% per, of incomers are getting 50% of their income from tech, capital gains and dividends, while the bottom 80% are getting only you know, 0 0.7% percent from uh, capital gains and dividends. However, tax rate for each income group in the United States has declined over time. You know, back in 1960s, you know, top 0.1 percent of incomers got almost 71 percent of tax rates. However, they're, they're, it has declined over time, and the top 0.01 percent of incomers are getting only 30 percent of tax rate. And, uh, you know, and it's a it has a similar trend for uh, top 0.1% and top 1%. So the inability to provide the necessary social protection can lead to backlashes against globalization. Because social protection is an important condition for globalization. While uh, globalization pressures government uh, to reduce uh, welfare spending, on the other hand, welfare compens compensation is also a very important condition for globalization. So if country, uh, a country have good social protection, you know, welfare, uh, high welfare spending, you know, to protect uh, those who are harmed by globalization, there's in general are higher support for globalization. And those countries with higher support for globalization tend to ha have higher level of globalization. And this graph shows the changes in pre predicted probability of pro-trade uh, pro attitude in import exposed uh, workers. So the data are, uh, are actually 10, uh, 10 OECD advanced countries and uh, the graph actually shows that a country which is spending on as, as, as a country spend more on unemployment compensation, there is a higher probability of, uh, uh, of pro-trade attitude in import-exposed uh, workers. So um, when the unemployment compensation was just 0.5 percent of GDP, there was negative impact, negative uh, pro-trade attitude in import exposed workers. However, it became insignificant as you know, a government's spending on unemployment compensation increase. And the public support for free trade also is uh, related to the level of uh, uh, trade, uh, level of imports and exports. As you can see, those countries with more public support for free trade uh, tend to have a higher level of imports and exports. So you can see United States at the bottom uh, is at the bottom of the you know graph. So U.S. has tend to have low level of public support for free trade, uh, and it has low level of imports and exports as a share of GDP compared to other advanced countries. So conclusion and policy implication. So rapidly increasing inequality in the United States can produce. As I explained, social tension and conflict and instability, all of which can hinder economic growth. So U.S. government's inability to, to pro, uh, provide necessary social protection can increase public dissent and result in backlashes against globalization. As we observed, in uh, this, uh, this picture shows the anti-globalization and, and anti-WTO World Trade Organization and anti-capitalism movement you know, in Seattle. So US, uh, the U.S. government needs to find ways to support for those who are left behind and harmed by globalization and deindustrialization. 
this is the end of my slide. <laughs> Thank you.